The year was 1969. The date was July 20th. 500 million people were watching TV. As Neil Armstrong took the last step off of the last rung of the lunar module, the Eagle, on the moon's surface, he stepped down and he said those famous words, that's one small step for man and a giant leap for mankind. A thrilling moment, no doubt, for all those who were around at that time. As a three-month-year-old baby, I remember it well. <laughs> but if you were around at that time and aware, <clears throat> as I wasn't yet, you probably have vivid memories of this event. But brethren, I want us to think about something. The step that Neil Armstrong took before he stepped onto the moon. Where was he? He was on the last rung of that ladder, wasn't he? And if you've seen pictures of it, the last rung. And then he took one small step off the ladder and he was on the surface of the moon. Isn't it ironic, as his statement points out, it was, it was just an ordinary step, like steps he had been taking his whole life. And yet that ordinary step put him on the face of of the moon. Now think about this a moment. It really was no different than the, the next to the last step. Now how would you like to be the next to the last step that Neil Armstrong took? You know, the one that gets no credit for anything from the second last rung to the last rung. The other step gets all the glory, right? All the credit. And yet that next to the last stop was step was just as important, was it not? If he hadn't taken that step, there would no be, be no step onto the moon. In fact, you could think of all kinds of steps if you roll it back a little bit. What about the first step out of the lunar module? What about the first step into the rocket four days earlier when he was on Earth? What about the step when he opened the door and left his house and stepped onto the porch as he left for the launch. Brethren, our life is full of steps, isn't it? And sometimes those steps are big and dramatic and awesome and life-changing, and sometimes the steps are pretty ordinary. But our life is made up of thousands and thousands and even millions of steps. A few weeks ago, Mr. Hernandez gave a sermon called Walk with God. And there have been other sermons, many sermons, actually. If you look on our website, you can <clears throat> take a look at some of them, a whole list of them. If you do a search about walking with God, you can see uh, Dr. Meredith, that was one of his favorite topics. He would also often talk about walking with God. There are a number of Sermons there, Dr. Winnale also, Seek and Walk with God. The concept is all over the Bible. We read in Genesis that Enoch walked with God 300 years. Abraham was told, walk with me and be perfect. We read in Ephesians that we should walk in love, walk worthy of our calling, walk as children of light. Mr. Diager quoted a, a scripture about walking worthy of our calling. Galatians says, if we live in the Spirit, we should walk in the Spirit. At the feast, we often read in Isaiah 2 about all nations coming to Jerusalem. They'll come and they'll say he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. That's how our life is described. So I have a couple of questions for you. If you can think about our life as a walk, and if you could think about the last time you were just walking down a sidewalk, maybe walking in the parking lot to come in the door today. Have you ever tried to take a step ahead of where you are? Let's say maybe 50 feet ahead of where 
you are. Now you, you think that doesn't make any sense because you can't step 50 feet ahead of where you are. And that's my point. How about have you ever tried to take a step behind yourself? Maybe 50 feet to where you've been. And you would also say that doesn't make any sense either because I can't do that. I've been there, but I'm here. I can't walk and take a step back there 50 feet back. But brethren, how many times in our lives are we either trying to live in the future or live in the past? Are we so focused on anticipating things that are going to happen in the future, or are we trying to do redos in the past? And it's just as preposterous because we cannot live in those two areas. I'd like to focus on an idea today as we look in the scriptures. If you want a title, it's simply taking the next step. Taking the next step. We are living in interesting times. Uh, one of the passages that we have heard many times, we read often in this context, is in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Let's turn over there. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. One, Paul writes, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And then he lists all kinds of things that will be happening in the last days, and we can almost day by day we can say, yeah, that describes our world today even better, even more as days go by. But I want to focus on the phrase here, in the last days, perilous times will come. If you have a new King James, look in the margin at what it says, at least in my Bible. It says, times of stress. Times of stress. Now, we think of perilous as being dangerous, and, and that is true. This, this word does convey that in part, but it also as a more general meaning, simply means hard to do, hard to take, or hard to bear. From a root word, possibly meaning the idea of reducing strength, something that reduces our strength, enabling us to bear up under stress. Paul said the last days would be times of stress. So how do we handle it? Well, I think one of the things we find in the Bible is we don't allow ourselves to get overwhelmed by tomorrow and we don't allow ourselves to worry about the past. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. We're going to uh, pick up the context of of a verse a little bit later, you probably can anticipate. But in Matthew 6 and verse 25, Jesus said, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now, if we stop and think for a moment about the audience Jesus was talking to, he wasn't talking to a 21st, I was going to say 20th century, no, we're in the 21st century, a 21st century audience in an air-conditioned room where we came today in our cars, and many of our cars have, you know, separate air conditioning for the passenger and for the driver, and you know, everything around us is very controlled, isn't it? Living in the Roman world, that was very different. A Roman soldier could come up to you at any time and compel you to carry his load for a mile. That's a very different world than the one we see in our day, isn't it? And economically, politically, a lot of uncertainty in that world 2,000 years ago. And yet Christ told them, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, the necessities of life. 
how do we look at the future? How do we ponder the future? What happens when society breaks down? We know it's going to happen. We know prophecy says it will happen. What happens when the, the grocery shelves are empty? What about when there are riots and we can't get to the store because it's too dangerous to drive down the street? What happens when the power is shut off or the oil is not available so we can't even drive our cars? What if we run out of food or water? We, we are in, encouraged to have emergency rations. We should do that for several weeks or, or longer. But as we see the writing on the wall and we read prophecies of society falling apart, brethren, are these concerns real? And maybe do these words of Jesus Christ resonate a little bit more than in our fairly comfortable lives right now? He said, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Going on, he says uh, in verse Verse, uh, verse 26, looked at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, nor yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Just as preposterous as, as walking 50 feet ahead, we can't worry ourselves taller, can we? Or shorter. It doesn't work. Verse 31, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In the context of God taking care of us today, he's, he does say, think about the future. He says, focus on the future, on where you're going, on the path. Make sure you're on the right path. Make sure you're going the right direction. You know, going back to the idea that our, our life is a journey, it's a walk, it's a path, I'm reminded of a statement that Stephen Covey said in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, what if you go through your whole life, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, striving up the ladder of success, climbing and climbing, and you get to the end of your life and you realize your ladder was against the wrong wall. Materialism, social status, fame and fortune, whatever. What if you strive and you realize, I, I was on the wrong wall, I was on the wrong path, I had the wrong goal. So we absolutely must think about the path we're on, where we're going, and verse 33 lays out that path. But what do we do next? What does God say? What does Christ say? Then, in verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What a profound collection of, of Scripture, of teaching from Christ. Lay out your future, lay out your path, make sure you're going in the right direction, but then don't worry about it. Live in the present. I think that's going to be more and more pertinent as we approach the end of the age, as this society starts to crumble. That God will, will guide us and be there to help us every step of the way. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, let's, let's turn... Back there, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is such a remarkable book. It's so unique and so intriguing because it starts with this very, in, in some ways, strange experiment by, by uh, Solomon, basically having anything he could have and, and turning out that he hated life. None of it made him happy. And then, as we go along, we find it, it seems to that, that he learned things, that he matured in some ways. 
And there are some really powerful things here about living and life that we, we read, we learn. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And, and we're not going to read all of those, but you can, you can look at them and think about it. There's a time for everything. And it seems like the point is to focus on the thing that that's the time for. Whether it's, you know, a time to plant or a time to pluck up what's been planted, a time to, to be born, a time to die. There, there are times in our life where these things happen. But going on in, in chapter 3 and verse 9, that's what I want to focus on, he says, What profit has the workers worker from that in which he labors? I've seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. What an interesting statement. In other words, he's saying, seems to be saying that at some level, we have, we're not animals. We are humans. We have the ability to understand to some degree the, the future, the afterlife, eternity. You know, it's harder to understand eternity past. We can't really comprehend never having a beginning, but we can sort of understand just going on and going on and going on to the future. Animals can't do that. He's given us the ability to think about where we're going and think about the end point and think about eternal life and our, and our goal and the gift that God has given us. And then notice verse 12. Then he goes right into it, another thought. He says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It is the gift of God. Now, at first glance, this looks like eat, drink, and be merry. But it's nothing could be further from the truth. I think what Solomon is saying is, think about the future. We have the ability to think about the future, eternity in our hearts, but live today and enjoy life today. And if God gives you blessings, then appreciate the blessings today. You know, Paul said that, I've learned to be content and I've learned to be abased. I've learned to, be, uh, to, to abound and be abased. And some days bring one, some days bring another. Whatever we are in, he says, appreciate what we have at the moment. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. This is the first scripture I ever memorized. <clears throat> As a young person, I think a preteen. I really liked this scripture. It was short, but easy to memorize. Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. The context seems to be, look, if you have something to do in front of you on your plate, focus on it. Do it. Work hard. Do your best. I remember having a, uh, a supervisor in college. He was not in the church, uh, but uh, he was a remarkable man, older man, on the landscaping crew. Kind of, uh, kind of cranky, at least we thought he was, as college students. Uh, but he, he would sort of get on us because as college students, we usually had a test we were studying for, so we had note cards. We had things that were in our pockets, and as we're trimming a bush, you know, you pull out a note card, and you're mem trying to memorize some, a list of things for your test, and you put it back, and he said, look, focus on what you're doing when you're doing it. When you're studying for a test, focus on that. When you're trimming the tree, focus on that. And there was a lot of wisdom in that. I also uh, learned in college, ran across a book, I think, or maybe it was in a class, I don't remember. But the importance of thinking about your life 
in terms of roles in your life. Uh, so we might think of, you know, one role is my spiritual life as a Christian. Another might be family-related. Am I a son or a daughter? Am I a husband or a wife, a, a, a father or mother? Another is my career. What do I do in my job? What's my role? Another is educating myself. What, what, is, what is my role as someone who, who continues to grow in education? And then you break down those roles and where you want to be. At the end of your life, maybe at 10 years in your life, maybe back at five years, one year, six months, you break down to those different roles. What, what's the goal you want for that specific role in your life in that time period? It has to be specific and it has to have a time limit. And then you break it down to what are you going to do this week in that role to ultimately reach that goal at the end. Now, when we think of goal setting, isn't that usually where they break down? You know, maybe I have a goal of, uh, I don't know, maybe you have a goal of wanting to go to the moon sometime, maybe be an astronaut. Maybe you don't, but let's just take that for example. Well, how are you going to get there? What are the intervening steps that will take you there, and what are we doing right now that eventually will turn into steps that will be like that Neil Armstrong step on the last rung of the ladder from the Eagle Lander? If we don't have a step today or this week that is ultimately pointing, maybe even just in a small way, but ultimately pointing to that goal, then that goal really isn't a goal. For example, what if I'm a single and one of my goals is to get married? And obviously there's, there's a lot of things beyond my control if I'm uh, wanting to, to be married. It has to do with God's will, etc. But what am I doing this week? And that's what the way the system would work. In, in, in planning out your goals, you have to sit down every week and think through, what am I doing in all of these roles in my life this week? So if I'm wanting to be a single and wanting to be married, what am I doing this week that will help me along in that process? Am I pushing myself to meet new people, perhaps, at Sabbath services? Am I pushing myself to write a letter to someone I'm trying to get to know? Am I reading a book which is teaching me about relationships? Whatever. The point is, I only have control over the present. I cannot live in the future, even though my goals reach out into the future. I think we can apply this even to mundane chores that we have at home. You know, sometimes we have a, a project that is so overwhelming that we can't look at the whole thing. Maybe it's a cleaning project. Maybe it's a painting project or a fixing something project. I've had one project that's been going on for years. <sighs> I'm looking forward to finishing that project. But sometimes it's, it's so big we get paralyzed because we can't handle the whole thing at once. We have to break it down into steps and figure out what am I going to do today, what am I going to do right now to move along. Remember that small step that Neil Armstrong made stepping off the Eagle Lander. That small step made history, but it was preceded by thousands of other steps. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9. He says um, here in chapter 11 and verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. What an interesting combination of thoughts he says here. He says, enjoy life. Let life be an adventure. It's a present it's a gift from God, but don't forget for what you're working for. Don't forget the behavior that is required to stay on the path of where you want to end up. Don't forget to conform to God's way. Don't wander off the path, or there will be real consequences. And then he says in the end, verse 10, 
Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity or fleeting, temporary, not here forever. God wants us to enjoy our life. He wants our young people to enjoy their lives and not be overly worried about the future or the past with the caveat that whatever we do in the present, there will be consequences, good or bad. So we have to remember that. We're on a path. But in the meantime, he says, enjoy life. Brethren, we need this mindset, especially in the end times, as we see our world falling apart, as we see the structure of our society crumbling, and as we understand prophecy, and we know how bad it can get, how are we going to view our life, and how are we going to view every day that we live up to the point of Christ's return? We need to keep an eye on the future, but not worry about the future. We also need to keep an eye on the past, but not worry about the past, too. Let's turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 18. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 18. Can we get so absorbed in the past that we forget to focus on the present? Ecclesiastes 5 verse 18 He says, here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him, for it is his heritage or portion. That's what God has given us. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it. Now stop there just for a moment because, you know, I think most of us don't really think of ourselves as being those who have riches and wealth. I think if I took a a show of hands, probably all of us would say, yeah, I'm not in that category. But stop a moment and think. What is he saying? Given him the power to eat of it. Remember Christ said, don't worry what you'll eat or drink. Do we have enough to eat? Do we have an abundance of food in this country? Do we have more selection and more variety and more quantity than people have had virtually in any time in history? Do we in the Western world have more than in other countries, even today, even some brethren in the church in other countries? Absolutely. I think it's safe to say that we have riches and wealth in terms of abundance compared to so many other people in the past and even today in the present. He says, uh, As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him the power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Now, maybe... He is saying here about dwelling unduly. Maybe he's referring to the fact that no matter how much we're blessed, there will be dark days that we struggle through. There will be difficult days. There will be times when life is not real fun. But maybe he's making a reference to not living in the past and dwelling on them and fretting over mistakes or fretting over dark times but being busy in the moment with the God, the job that God gives us to do. Just taking the next step. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Because yes, we do need to think about the future, and yes, we do need to think about the past, but not dwell on it. We need to think about the past to learn lessons but not wallow in the mistakes we've made. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul writes, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. 
Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So there's an acknowledgement of the goal, of where he's going, but there's also an element here, he says, brethren, I don't worry about the past. I've let that go. Now, we can stop and think for a moment in the context. A lot of what he's talking about is that all the, the, all the good things he had in the past, all the things he had accomplished in the past, he was letting them go. But we can't forget how many people he had hurt in the church in the past as well. Remember when he was persecuting people? Remember he, when he was dragging them out of their homes causing them to be arrested, even, he says, causing some to blaspheme. You think Paul had anything that sometimes plagued him about his past? And yet he said, look, I've learned from it. I've repented of it bitterly, I'm sure. But I'm moving on. I'm not going to live in there because I have to live in the present. And it's a powerful lesson for us. Forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward for those things which are. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We can't go back. Just as ludicrous as it is to say that you go back 50 feet when you're walking down the, down the, uh, down the path, we cannot go back into the past. We don't get a do-over. This is not a video game, is it? We can't get mired in the mistakes of the past. Sometimes it's not us that hinders our movement forward. Sometimes it's others. You know, parents, we can have a view of our children at a certain age, a certain time in their life that they'll never change. And we can pigeonhole them in a certain way. Siblings can do that to one another. You'll always be this way. You've always been that way. And someday when they are trying to change and they attempt to break out of it and they are sincerely trying to be different, they may be ridiculed or put down. Like, what are you trying to prove? What are you trying to do? We can actually hold people back from overcoming what they're trying to overcome. It's like in the, in the Philippines, they have this concept of, of, uh, of crabs in a bucket. You have a bunch of crabs in the bucket, live crabs, and, and one crab is trying to get out of the bucket, and the other crabs reach up and grab and pull him back into the bucket. You know, someone's trying to be different. Someone's trying to grow, and yet others are, are pulling them back. Sometimes those who are closest to us can be our harshest critics because they're not letting us be different, not letting us grow. Parents, children, other brethren, we need to put the past in the past and give room to others to grow. Do we need to learn from the past? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 we need to learn from every lesson of the past. We talk about that, think about that during the days of Alema Bread in the Passover season. We can learn lessons from our own past. We can learn lessons from others' pasts and their examples that are written down for us. You know where I'm going, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. He says, now these things became our examples. And then he talks through things that the Israelites fell into and that the mistakes they made and that we should learn from. And then in verse 11, he says, now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We've got to have one eye on the future We've got to have one eye on the past to learn the lessons and how we grow, but we can't live there, can we? 
We have to live in the present. That's the only thing we can do anything about. You ever notice that? You can't do a thing about the future except for what you're doing right now, and you can't do a thing about the past. The only thing that we can do is right now in the moment we're at. And look at the encouragement he gives us about the individual steps in that present moment. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Does God ever give us a step, a moment in the present that we can't handle? No. Emphatically, no. Sometimes we think we can't handle it, but he does not give us a moment we can't handle. Do challenges in the future sometimes seem too daunting? Absolutely. But you know, when we're a kid, driving a car seems daunting, doesn't it? When you're four years old, driving a car, that's impossible. Maybe a bike hasn't even, you know, the two-wheeler hasn't even, I forget now, when do we learn to ride a bike, bike, bike four or five, whatever, maybe three. No, no offense to the, any of uh, the children who are already riding a bike at that age. The point is, when you're small, some of the things that adults do are kind of big and scary. What about getting married, having a wife or a husband, having children, having a family, buying a house? That's all kind of big and scary. But then, when you get older, you're ready. When you're a child, you take the step that you're ready for, learning to tie your shoes. And that's a big deal in that moment, isn't it? Learning to ride that bike, learning to go into the first grade. You're ready for that moment. What about when you're a father and mother and children are born into your family? You know, I'm grateful our children didn't arrive as 14-year-olds. Nothing against 14-year-olds, mind you, again. But as new parents, you have, you have this little child, and all that little child needs is for you to take care of it, protect it, feed it, change its diaper, keep it clean, make sure it doesn't get hurt. Okay, that we can do. We're not yet ready yet for teenagers. But that we can do. And doesn't God give us steps that we can handle along the way and nothing more? Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, talking about the, the, the challenges facing us today. Hebrews chapter 3. Paul is writing here, he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes Psalm 95, but I'll just read it here as he quotes it. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Actually, hold your place there. Let's do go back to Psalm 95 because I want to show something to you. Psalm 95. This is David writing to his time. So think about how long ago this was. What, almost 3,000 years ago? Long, long time ago? Writing to his time, referring to what happened to the Israelites, he says, Psalm, 90, Psalm 95, uh, what, what I just read starts in verse 8, but let's go back a little bit um, and read in verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and shout joyfully. 
For the Lord, verse 3, is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Verse 6. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. He sets the stage by saying, look, this is the God we serve, who has everything under his control. And then he talks about the Israelites, and we won't go back there, but if you want to look at it later on, it is in Exodus 17. The Israelites, when they were being led by God like sheep, through the wilderness, and they didn't have water, and they complained, and it turned to bitterness, and it turned to unbelief and rebellion, and they finally said, is God among us or not? David was using that as an object lesson, and he was saying, look, remember who we serve. And remember that today is the day to hear his voice. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. Let's turn back to Hebrews because Paul writes it, Paul uh, quotes it, and applies it to us now. He says, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Brethren, do we need to live in the present? Do we need to think about what we're doing right now, today? Yes, having our eye on the future, our goal, our path, where we're going to end up, where we want to end up. Yes, thinking about the mistakes that we've made that we can learn from, that we don't want to repeat, we can grow from. But realizing that all we can control is today. And it's interesting, too, when he talks about them having an evil heart of unbelief, let's Let's take a step back again and stop and think, what were the children of Israel complaining about? They didn't have their necessities. They didn't have water. What happens when society breaks down? Does food security be an issue? Could we someday be in a situation where we're in a similar situation with the Israelites. Will will we be any different? When the necessities of life are less secure than they are right now, or seem less secure. Can God provide a table in the wilderness? Their fear, the Israelites, their fear of not having enough to eat or drink led to uncertainty, led to worry, led to anger, led to bitterness, led to rebellion. How do we face the future? And you know, the parallel with our day is very strong. Our world is about to exit an era of Satan's rule just like the Israelites were exiting a time and a place of Satan's rule in in that sense in Egypt. They were going to a promised land, and we are striving to enter a period of a thousand years under the leadership of Jesus Christ. But just like the Israelites, Satan does not give up his grasp on society easily. And there will be problems and difficulties before we reach that wonderful age. But will we trust that God can take care of our necessities? He says in chapter 3 and verse 12, we already read that, 
but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin can come from a lot of different beginnings, right? Fear of the future can lead us to rebel against God. Unbelief, not trusting. You know, Mr. Weston has often pointed out the greatest predictor of success in the future is what we're doing right now. And that's really interesting to think about. You know, if we want to have courage next month or next year or five, five years from now, are we acting with courage in the small steps we take today? Are we, we facing up to a difficult conversation we need to have? Are we facing a, a boss who is challenging us about the Sabbath? Are we having the courage to say I'm sorry to someone we offended? Courage comes in many forms. You know, frankly, having courage in this modern age of pandemics. You know, for many of our brethren who, who have vulnerabilities, just functioning in this age takes a lot of courage. And I think we have to honor them for that. If we want to have trust in God in the future, am I trying to build trust in God right now? in problems I'm facing today. You know, maybe I have a long-term health problem. Maybe I don't know what the next turn will be, the, next, the twists and turns in my life. Maybe I don't know how it will be resolved. Maybe I'm just having to bear up right now and trust God. Maybe I'm in a point in my life where there are a lot of uncertainties and I don't know What's going to happen in my future? There are a lot of questions around the bend. Sometimes it's hard to see, but it takes faith and trust to plan, to set goals, but also to trust that God, if we walk with him daily, he will, he will guide us in our lives. You know, many years ago, we were visiting a member, someone who's long gone now, but he asked what is the church doing to help brethren get ready for the tribulation? And it became obvious as we talked that he wanted a sort of boot camp, you know, where we learn to handle physical deprivation, maybe, maybe uh, you know, mountain wilderness training, survival training, a desert survival training or something, you know, under, under really harsh conditions. Now, actually, to some of our young men, that's how... Sounds like uh, a lot of fun, maybe, you know, uh, going through sort of a boot camp. But as we were talking, I, I, I tried to explain, I don't think I got through, but that the training that prepares us for the future is not boot camp. Look at what Peter did. Peter was a tough guy. And yet when it came down to it, he was not prepared for what he faced when Christ was arrested. What's the training that prepares us for the uncertainties ahead? The challenges in, in the future are spiritual in nature. They are going to require spiritual training. Our walking with God is what prepares us for the challenges of the future. Not, not some artificial scenario we create but walking with God every day, every moment. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, uh, he designates a certain day saying, and David today after such a long time as it has been said, today if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You know, every week we sit and we listen to sermons, sermonettes, uh, Bible studies, we read articles, and that means even sermons right now. And he says today, if you're listening, hard not your heart. What is God saying to me right now? Not that this sermon is any more special than any other sermon we've ever heard. But truly, what is God speaking to us today? What is he telling you today? Now, you know, we might ask ourselves, uh, what step am I on in my life? It might be a super mundane, ordinary even we might say boring step. You know, my life might seem like 
my steps are fairly boring right now. And yet, what is God telling me right now about the step I need to take? You know, sometimes we want solutions that are big and awesome and powerful, like the Syrian general who had leprosy, and he wanted, was not Elisha, to come out and, 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 and command that this, that this leprosy would be gone? And he was frankly disappointed that Elisha sent his servant and said, well, just go dip in the water seven times and it'll be gone. He was disappointed. He wanted something spectacular and awesome. But God often works with us in building character and resilience in the ordinary, mundane, even somewhat boring steps that we take every day. But those steps taken over and over and over and over and over and over again lead to remarkable things. There is a principle called the 10,000-hour rule. It was popularized by Canadian journalist and writer Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers. And basically the idea is if you want to become an expert at something, it'll take you 10,000 hours of practice. And we can see this in life. You know, those who excel in any profession or creative endeavor, skill, they put in years and years and years of doing that thing, don't they? Until they are so proficient at it that it's second nature. There was an article in Epoch Times that applied this to relationships. July 28, 2021. The title is Practice Makes Perfect, Lives Well Lived. The writer said, Some 20 years ago, our culture stressed the importance of spending quality time with, with our children and those we love, especially our children. Quality time is well and good, but we should also recognize the importance of quantity time. Uh, Mr. Weston brought this out in his uh, sermon about child rearing not long ago. That afternoon, you spend on the porch shooting the breeze with a friend about nothing in particular is valuable. You're practicing your friendship. That evening, you and your spouse spend reading books on the sofa, perhaps occasionally pausing to read aloud a passage you want to share or simply discuss some mundane matter adds to your marriage, even in some small and seemingly insignificant way. So the 10,000-hour rule is relevant here. Experts put in time, energy, and passion to, to win renown. We, too, can give ourselves to those we love practicing and learning the arts of love along the way. In other words, practicing in everyday situations, we can become experts at taking steps, ordinary steps, one by one by one by one, and eventually those steps lead right to the kingdom. If God has given us a window of opportunity, brethren, today, and that's the point. We're all here today. And it's today. The opportunity is now, today. Then we need to take it. And I don't know what step you need to take. You don't know what step I need to take. But there is a step that is in our life today that we need to take. What is it? And are we listening to God and asking him to show us Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, notice, Matthew 24 and verse 7, there are difficult times coming, we know that, we read about that, we hear about that, Matthew 24, I won't read the whole uh, list here, but he says in verse 7, nation will rise against nation, Kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. The implication is sort of like birth pangs, leading to a deliverance, very much like a birth. My wife and I have talked about this, the childbirth process. She has a lot more experience than I do in this. <clears throat> But she says, you know, when those contractions start to come, you can't stop them. They are just coming. And they're difficult, but there are ways to make them harder or easier. The hard way is to get overwhelmed by everything. Be super anxious and even fight the process along the way. But there is an easier way. 
And one, one of our children, as one of our children was being born, at a particularly rough time, I was there with her and I said to her, just think about that beautiful baby that will be in your arms very soon. You're almost there. And she said later, that really, really helped. There are other things I said that didn't help at all. <laughs> Actually made it worse. But that's the one thing I said in, that was worked. But you know what else ha- helped, she said? Yes, thinking about that baby that's going to be in your arms, but also not thinking about the hours of labor between now and then but just thinking about the one contraction that's coming next. Taking a breath, getting ready for that one contraction. And then when that one is over, taking a breath, getting ready for the next one. It's like, I can do this one by one. I can't take them all at once. That's overwhelming. But I can do this one by one. Again, I'm going to have to take her word for it because I've never been through that in particular. But think about how it relates to our life today. And as this age is really coming to a conclusion, God will be with us and God will help us and God will guide us through every moment as we have the big goal and we're not worrying, we're not anxious. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, we will worry sometimes. Yes, we'll be anxious sometimes. David was. But he worked through it, didn't he? And we won't overly worry about the past. We'll learn from it. But mostly, we'll ask God to guide us through the present. Let's look at a few as we get closer to wrapping up here. Notice I didn't say wrapping up, just getting closer to wrapping up. That means almost nothing. <laughs> uh, look, let's look at some practical things as we, as we uh, bring this down a little bit to a practical level. Number one, what are some things that we can do? As we, yes, look to the future, and yes, remember the past, but try to live in the present. Number one, re- make sure to remove sin to make your load lighter. Make sure to remove sin to make your load lighter. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, we read something very, very familiar. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's, it's the metaphor of a running a race. And when you're running a long-distance race, yes, you have the goal. Yes, you have sort of a strategy of how to get there. But at some point, it's just slogging out every step. And it's just thinking, I can take this step. Okay, now I can take another step. Okay, now I can take another step. And it's taking one step after another, and eventually you get there. But you don't want to have extra weight that you're carrying in your hands. And so he's saying, look, if we have, if we're, it's like we're carrying weights as we're trying to run a race, that's going to weigh us down. And that's what sin does. So we acknowledge and we, we, we recognize, we ask God to help us to see ourselves. And if we do have sin, we repent. And then it's like those, those weights are thrown down and we, we have new energy. And we don't, we're not carrying that extra load around anymore. Number two, number two, we pray about the small steps. We pray about the small steps. First, First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse 16. Sometimes we can feel that God is so busy. He, 
you know, this, this thing, this little thing I'm dealing with, it's not enough to bother him about. He's too busy. I mean, he's running the world. He's, he's working out, you know, national geopolitical things. And we don't talk to him about things that really we need to talk to him about. First Thessalonians 5, verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Does he mean that we walk around literally praying nonstop? I don't think so. I think he means that we, as a way of life, we, we pray every day. We continue to pray. We don't let that flag. But even as a way of life, and I think Dr. Meredith used to talk about this and explain it, as we're going through our day, as we need help, as we have a decision to make, when a situation comes up, when we just need clarity on an issue, we stop. If we can, we kneel down. If we can't, that's okay. God still knows and hears us and he can read our thoughts. We pray, we connect with him throughout the day in the moment because that moment is the only thing we can do anything about, can't we? The future we can't live in, the past we can't live in, that moment when we need help, we are to be instant in prayer and go to God. And why not go to God if we need that decision or that circumstance to succeed? Mr. Ames uh, used to talk about uh, things that he learned from Mrs. Ames about how before going to the store, the grocery store, she would pray. And he thought at first, why? But then she would get great deals, and things would work out. And at least my read on it, he became a believer. He thought, yeah, that's a great idea. Why wouldn't we want help? You know, especially as money is tight, why wouldn't we help, want God's help when we go asking for him to stretch the budget, finding good deals? Is that too mundane to pray about? Is that too insignificant? Well, maybe we should try it if we haven't. And see, does God care? Does he do things? Does he work things out? You know, one thing I've learned in my life, the more I take areas of my life, different areas of my life to God in prayer as a regular thing, as something that I talk to him about, have a dialogue with him about the fewer stupid mistakes I make. That's the rod rule. You can write that down. <laughs> Number three. Number three, let Christ help you with your load. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Let Jesus Christ help you with your load. This is similar to one, but... Let's read it here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, he said, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, the analogy of moving down a path with a load, with a yoke or we might say a backpack in our vernacular today. And he says, look, I'm, I'm there every step you take. Frankly, he says, let me handle it. Let me take it. Brethren, how often do we not think of letting him take it or we refuse to let him take it? We say, I can handle this. I can do this. And yet he's right there. He's saying, look, I'm offering there's a better way than how you're doing it. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And, of course, there's a lot in that verse to unpack. But the point is, Jesus Christ is our Savior. But not only our Savior, he is walking beside us in this journey. And he will help us with our load if we want it. But we have to ask. You know, in, in 2014, Admiral William 
H. McRaven gave a commencement address at University of Texas. <clears throat> you may have heard about this. You, many of you probably have on YouTube. Um, but he, he talked about uh, one of the life lessons. He was a SEAL. He was uh, in SEAL training, eventually became a commander of, the, of, the, of that, uh, those, those uh, servicemen. But uh, one of the life, life lessons he gave, if you want to change the world, make your bed. He said this in the talk, The wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. As the first task of the day, it will give you a small sense of pride. It will encourage you to do another task and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you'll come home to a bed that has been made by you. And a bed, made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. You know, brethren, what do we learn at the fall feast days? What do we learn at the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles? We learn that God is going to change the world that Christ is going to change the world. And we learn that the saints have an opportunity to be there with him, to help and assist in changing the world. How do we get there? How do we do that? We think about what we're doing in the moment, right now, today, today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today. Christ said, John chapter 9, verse 4, I'll just refer to it. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night's coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of this world. Our time is not limitless. We have an opportunity now, today to make a difference, to walk with God, to be preparing for awesome things. Let's turn over in conclusion to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. <clears throat> Paul wrote, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, just like that, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, and will be in the kingdom. You know, Neil Armstrong prepared for, and trained for, and worked for, and sacrificed for that step, didn't he? That last step off that last rung onto the surface of the moon. And then he, he trained for it, he worked for it, and then he took it. God is offering us eternal life. If we walk with him, if we stay on that path, if we humble ourselves, if we continue to repent and ask him to help us to learn and grow, let go of sin, let Christ carry our load, pray about each step, not fretting about the future, looking to the future, but not 
fretting about it, not worrying about the past. Yes, learning from it, but not worrying about it. There will come a day when we take one more step. One small step for man. And a pretty giant leap for mankind, wouldn't you say? Just one step. Step from physical life to spirit life forever. Brethren, as we find ourselves on this end of that spectrum, let's remember, just take the next step.